quick question. When did you become a TikTok influencer? What? Oh, do you not know this trend? A tick, uh, it, it's a it's a TikTok influencers buy a remote mic, such as a weird tiny DJI thing that you are currently <laughs> using to record, yeah. and then they just hold it there like a like a little reporter <sighs> microphone. <laughs> well, I'm and trying to figure out a way to mount it to my collar because I don't want to hold it the whole time. There, <laughs> this is the world's okay? shortest episode. <laughs> uh, just a quick five minute check in. Hey, buddies, friendos, we need a name for our listener brethren. Listeners? Yeah, Endlessly listeners feels appreciated. Rude. <laughs> you are you, that is now pointed away from your face. Oh, so it is worse. Okay. It is worse. Yeah. Uh, maybe right. clip it the other way around. No, other way around. You don't have to hold it like an influencer. Like to put the put the heavy part on the inside, so it's pointed up at your face. How's this? A little better. I don't know. You're the one that edits this. This it's is gonna a balancing be your... act. Yeah, it's fine. I'll just replace my voice with AI. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. You bet. <laughs> I'm Why kidding. not? Someone. I would someone, never. Someone. Uh, someone wrote me a, an email this week. And was like, hey, you know, I saw there wasn't an EA last week. Would love one this week. Uh, if you need to, you could, there's probably enough audio of Sam that you could just put him into a thing and make an AI Sam. And I was like, no. They said no, that in the can. message? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were like, you just make an AI Sam. Maybe maybe we could do one where we're both AIs and we're just talking. And there there are a couple other. of... Uh, you know new startups that are like hey just create this avatar we need 20 pictures of you and it looks like crap of course but you know people are jostling 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 for that angle in the ai world i have to say it's gonna be weird but um can i just say so i apologize for you know not having episodes maybe the last week and a half or two but i shared a screenshot of my calendar to all my patrons patrons if you're curious to see just how busy i've been i've had one two three four five six six shoots four of which are weddings and uh uh almost none only one of which was in dc and then uh the past three four days i've been in um waterloo canada for a conference and can i just say by the way uh daniel so you're aware just so many I'm people aware. came up to me and said how much they love this podcast. So, it, yeah. you know, I know you don't always get that direct feedback. And I just like almost everyone I met was like, oh, my God, I love the podcast. And I was like, which one? Because I didn't think they would be talking about this one. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> rude. Which podcast no, would they be talking about? How many podcasts yeah. do you have, Sam? Just the just the. Just the just Epic me. Podcast. So I never realized, but the that Epic doesn't. Podcast, I don't know if it still does, but for a long time, it was one of the top surfaced, if you just at all searched podcasts for wedding photography. Uh, I doubt it is anymore, but uh, a lot of people used to listen to that. And uh, But you know, it's been like four years since we've really had time. I can it's, shoot it, weddings. I shot weddings. I shot a wedding like a week ago. Easy I'm breezy. trying to convince you to sell the Fuji and buy two Nikon ZFs with a couple lenses because it's all you would need for a wedding. I can't. I didn't use it with a flash, but I can't tell you how fantastic that camera is. It's it's scary good. It's they they nailed it. I don't know. I'm not frozen. Say. I'm just. I'm a, just. <laughs> yeah. It's got a mechanical shutter like the Z8. One of the biggest complaints, right? Of course, is the pure silent or sound effect only shutter. This has an actual mechanical shutter. Uh, it's got the retro dials that some people love, some people hate to adjust ISO and app or uh, ISO and shutter. But you can flip those dials to a mode that you can control with just regular uh, yeah. index finger and thumb wheel because those are still built in. And it's just good. It's just so good. Now, the only thing I will say, the colors. So they launched them in, in different varieties of colors yes, you can buy there's pink yeah sorry like coral. red and green coral and uh it looks cool it looks cool on the uh website like the colors like i was thinking a look in person a little forest green it looks like someone taped a sticker on in person like <laughs> it's high quality it doesn't feel cheap it just looks like a fake leather sticker so i would recommend going just all black if you're gonna do 
if you want like a genuine retro feel. I mean, you know, unless you really, really, really like colors. I um, do. It's I a bummer they didn't it. release like a silver version. That would have been, I think, pretty great for the retro, kind of like they did with the uh, DF. The first DF was like a silvery, whatever. Um, but the DF, as great as it was, I don't know if you ever was that ever on your radar back when that came out. It was their DSLR. Uh, I believe retro. Tom has one actually mm. on uh, on his shelf behind him so anytime we have a zoom call i'm like oh look at that old thing it's so cute it's so cool and my friend uh i bought one when it came out because it had the sensor of the d3s i think and the d750 or no no, no. yeah yeah the d750 like it had a fantastic sensor for the price just the coolest looking thing i ended up selling it to my friend Nathan, who shot with it for years and it was it was pretty much the perfect dslr camera at the time aside from in order to get a uh, exposure preview of, or, or like the, the depth of field preview yeah. in live view, if you wanted to use it, you had to hold a button the entire time. I remember that being like, a, what the hell? Like It wasn't toggleable. You couldn't customize it in any other way. You had to hold the button down the entire time you wanted to see the, the preview. Nathan just dealt with it because every other aspect of the camera was great and the sensor was really, really good. But the ZF from, I, I only shot you know uh, one session with it for about 30 minutes and so maybe something else will pop up but i didn't see anything in it uh come across any feature or setting that was like oh they they you know nuked this or whatever the term to um to make sure people still buy the z8 for some reason or whatever so back in the back in the day back in the day i I love it when i say back in the day and what i really mean is like 2009 (laughs) <laughs> uh, which I guess is a day, but you know, just a day went back in one day. Uh, you know, there was, there was that, uh, big push where first like full frame cameras really came out and were getting really good. And everyone was like, you need to shoot on full frame. You have to have a full frame camera if you're going to be a real wedding photographer. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, a Canon 5d versus a Canon 20 or 30 D no contest like light years different sensor that's no longer true though right like you can you can shoot a you can shoot a wedding on an xt5 right like the the a 40 megapixel cropped fuji sensor is pretty great and is going to give you great results uh sorry this is this is because you've been trying to convince me to sell a a camera to buy things for wedding stuff and then i was very confused i was like oh i need enough you know like i i had been looking at the uh sony a7c2 and i had mm-hmm. said oh well 33 megapixels that's enough to shoot a wedding on and you were like 20 is enough to shoot a wedding on like come on chill for sure. uh and i was, i when you said that i was like hoo, 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 hoo. how dare you uh anyway the wedding i shot uh, uh two weeks ago uh, I second shot a wedding, and to make it easier on the first shooter, uh, I just borrowed their one of their backup kits so they could just take the card and the camera and disappear instead of trying to be like, okay, well, here are 400 gigs of <laughs> GFX photos. I was just like, here's your camera. And it was a, it was an R3, and it was like a, which is like a 21 megapixel, you know, full frame Canon body. And so then I accidentally shot a wedding at like 20 megapixels. And you know what it was? Enough. Uh, yeah, uh, so totally like, what is. are the, what are the real, I, you know, there, there were a lot of rules back in the day that we had to come up with, uh, for a lot of reasons, right? You know, like people weren't taking photography super seriously. And as we transitioned to digital, it was like, oh, we have to spend more money to prove that we are better. And that like, we're <laughs> legit photographers. Here's our money. We spent it on yeah. this thing. Uh, you know, make sure you tell everyone you're shooting with a full frame camera, make every, you know, like there's all this, there were, there was a lot of stuff that we kind of like put up or, or gatekeepy type things that like as an industry, we kind of put up and that's, uh, no longer true. So like, what are you Not looking true, for? Not true, but still happens <laughs> by the way. Yeah. Still, yeah. still definitely happens. So like, what are you, you know, like you're not gonna buy two ZFs and, and shoot weddings on that from now on right like you're gonna correct not no do but that. <laughs> but you 100 percent could if you were looking for a pivot to nikon which their z8 z9 and now zf i think uh 
the autofocus, at least compared to any Canon camera I've used, is superior. Obviously, Canon will release a newer wave of stuff soon enough. I'm sure the next R5 will maybe be superior. Who knows? But if you're you know, already in the Nikon ecosystem, even if you don't have the uh, Z-mount glass uh, adapted through their second version of their adapter, um, adapted F-mount glass from DSLR days works wonderfully they're like really really good so anyway it's just increasingly affordable to be able to make the jump and shoot a wedding with the the zf if you wanted to it's the most affordable entry point into being able, I, I don't know i guess if i added up two zfs and a couple lenses how that would compare to the cheapest sony option i'm not sure i bet sony still wins out on price but the zf compared to the brief time i i didn't do a whole shoot with it but compared to the brief time i had the um Sony a7C two or whatever, the newest a7C yeah. that somebody brought to a workshop of mine. ZF just handles way better. And uh, the Nikon menus are superior. And it's just a way cooler looking camera. And there's always something to that. There is always something to that retro vibe. So I'm, I'm buying one just to, uh, I, I, maybe I'll shoot some sessions with it randomly. I'll bring it to a wedding as a backup camera. I wanna buy it with, surprise to me, the 40 millimeter f2.0 which is the only lens i shot uh, my session with and i you know i've always loved 45 and well i've always loved 50 millimeter let's start there obviously we've talked about yeah. that a lot it's your thing but but i secretly sort of always preferred the 45 tilt shift um it just gives a little bit more breathing room in a way that i love and i surprisingly loved the 40 millimeter it's funny how it's encroaching into 35 millimeter land which i do not like you're getting like so 35. close but the 40 the 40 f2 was just so great to shoot with um so light it's like a featherweight lens because it just isn't a huge giant prime i mean it is a prime but it doesn't have a huge you know aperture and uh yeah, it's it's great. So as like a walk around travel camera, the ZF with the 40, they really nailed it. I'm, I'm super impressed. Now, I'm hoping uh, I don't get one and spend you know more than 30 minutes shooting with one. I took about 10, 15 minutes to configure it uh, before my session and then shot for 20, 30 minutes. And I hope I, you know, after a day or two or a couple hours, I don't discover something because that's happened before. You have the uh, the new car smell of a, a great camera yeah. and everything about it is perfect and you're just so excited. And then, you know, after about a week, you realize you've been lying to yourself about some something that you just like forcing yourself to overlook or you're it just you're in denial about like this annoying whatever Every camera seems to always have one or two annoying things where you're like, ah, oh, they could just fix this. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that doesn't happen with the ZF. Uh, but you're right. I, I don't personally plan. It's not so compelling and worth it to switch. I would consider it if the Nikon Z50 1.2 was about the same size lens as the Canon. But that 51.2 is just freaking huge. It's just such a big lens. I don't want it to be my workhorse. Okay, but you could get the even bigger lens of the 58.95 Noctilux. I think it's a 50.95, but yeah, it's the manual focus only incredibly crazy. Wait, that one's manual focus only? Yeah, the 0.95, yeah. The huge oh. giant one, yeah. The more you know. Uh, yeah, I so I was, like I have British spent... Person. Uh, you haven't, you know, we haven't been talking for the last like 10 days. You've been very busy. We've been talking. And so I've just been over. Oh, well, yeah, I know. But like not our regular long <laughs> chit chats. Yeah. Uh, and so I've been I've been all up in myself about like I took a I took a much mushroom foraging class last oh, weekend. Okay. Uh, it was adorable. It was very nice. Uh, but because we were hiking, I didn't want to bring the GFX. So I brought my Leica and I was like. Like 20 minutes into that hike, I was like, this camera is perfect and I love everything about it and I should probably sell it. Uh, oh, nice. Okay. I finally, I'm finally coming around. Well, it's just that like, I'm not using it. And the yeah. whole time when I, you know, like when I saw something like a good photo, it was perfect for snapshots. If I, uh, you know, like if I was just carrying around a camera every day, all day for a snapshot, here's my stuff. Uh, you yeah. know, here's my life documenting my life. Uh, perfect camera would, would keep forever. Still want to keep this, uh, forever for that. But it's like, that's not a great reason to keep 
bit. I guess it right. is like I mean it is a great reason to keep it, but it's also like okay, but that it's like forty five hundred bucks that I could sell it for right now. That is a lot of other cameras. That's right? a lot of money. I would sell that sucker <laughs> ASAP. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a. Sorry. I even have the box in a cl- in this closet. Can we, can we so. talk about that for a second? I can don't just... know why people <laughs> like boxes. <laughs> it I... literally makes like a ten or fifteen percent difference in price if you've got the box and manuals. And when people ask that, it's all, I know what's coming next. If I say no, it's like, oh, can you give me a, a discount then? It's like, what are you talking about? The camera is <laughs> the, the thing you're buying. Oh, okay, well, it is a very nice box. Uh, if, you sure. know, like, it slides out, and then it fo- it's like it has a very nice linen felt type thing, and then it opens. Can, it's a very uh, pleasing like box good. experience. Yeah. Like uh, good. It, it is clearly a $100 box. Right, like Leica has spent over a hundred dollars manufacturing this box to put their camera mm. in. Uh, so you know, I kept it. Well, no, I kept it because it would be resale value. But I kept it because it felt nice, and I knew that it would get me more money down the line. <sighs> I also, for whatever reason, still have my MacBook uh, Pro box up there. I don't know why. This uh, everything's a mess. I'm a mess. I have too many boxes in my life. I don't know why people keep boxes. You don't keep boxes. I mean, you have. I, I a literal some mountain randomly. of boxes in your home, <laughs> Those are the but. packaging boxes. I do keep some, and it's, I guess, in one way, it's it's just sort of uh, to have something easy to ship it in, it, like secure to ship it in later if I know I'm going to resell it. But it doesn't really make sense about the overall price negotiating yeah. uh, leverage that it provides. It, I guess in backs of a lot of people's heads is is that, randomly if you get lucky certain pieces of photography equipment can appreciate in value now if it becomes a collector's item eventually then i could see the case for having the case uh <laughs> and, good one uh, i'm glad you, you know, did and all the manuals and, and materials that it comes with but otherwise it's just like well, no i just have the lens it doesn't even have the lens caps just it works it's not scratched buy it for me for as much as you're willing to pay yeah it's so i think I think I'm going to sell it. I'm probably going to sell it. Uh, and then I I am going to, I'll just do a pinky promise with the person. Right? Like, I think that's my, I think my plan is to do a pinky promise with whoever I sell it to. Like, hey, if you ever sell this in the future, I get right of first refusal, pinky promise. Because, like, oh, I do love the camera and I do want to, like, keep it. But it's also, like, I want to make other stuff, more stuff. Yeah. Right. I was also looking, I was like, oh, maybe I could sell every piece of camera gear I own and buy the new GFX, the GFX 100, the second. They call it the second for some reason. I don't know why. Mm. Uh, instead of just two, <laughs> but they've been yeah. pronouncing it the second. Uh, it does like nice video things now, like way better than the 100S and the autofocus is faster. And uh, you get eight frames per second, which is enough for people kissing. Yeah, that's undeniably great, but it's uh, so much overkill for wedding. I, I don't even. I'm trying to imagine. How right. Much so I, I I literally just shot twenty on twenty megapixels for regular size. What? How big of how big are the files that you deliver people? Like, what do you export your galleries at? Like two thousand pixels, uh, full res. Longest 40? edge is five thousand pixels. So. Okay. Um, yeah, Lightroom has a couple of different export options. Let me pull it up. This is actually a good thing to talk through. Um, where you can specify the exact uh, you know, width and height resolution yeah. that you want. And then what mine is set to do, 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 is, OK, export full, JPEG 84 and 84. color space S. SRGB. So I'll talk about that in a second. And then okay. um, sharpen for screen standard. That's just a little bit of light sharpening. We don't have to talk about sharpening today, but that's a whole other topic. But resolution, I do long edge, 5,000 pixels at 240 pixels per inch. The So whether it's a portrait orientation or a landscape orientation, it's going to uh, export at 5,000 pixels. And um, you could uh, establish a percentage or a specific megapixel or height and weight resize, but uh, 5,000 seems like, or it is, more than enough to print at any print size um, that's available in my, like, 
lab that's attached and pretty much any it's big enough for any print anybody reasonably is going to make of themselves but uh the problem like i get more than that from my camera i want to say six thousand is the yeah output yeah six thousand by four thousand and um you know i crop just enough that i don't want somebody to have some that are 6,000, some that are 5,400, 5,700, 5,800, you know, 5,758 uh, pixels wide. Like I want some baseline of mostly everything is about the same so that it's just even in case my clients start diving in and looking at the resolutions for some reason and then start asking questions about how come they're all like a range between 5,000 and 6,000 pixels. There's no consistency here. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, it, so 5,000 is, is what I do. And well, sorry, what was the core question with that? Were you just curious about? Yeah, I was just, you know, okay. like the, right, like returning a GFX file is not a, it's right. not, You're it's not like, it's like a 60 megapixel, 10, 000, yeah, uh, uh, or Jesus. a 60 megabyte JPEG when you export it. Like you can't export a full res, um, or you can't upload a full res uh, GFX file to glass because we have a 50 megapixel yeah, limit. It's the uh, long range is 11,648 pixels. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. No. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's the best. I took a photo of a spider web today that I could print on the side of a house. That's cool. right. You know, what a treat. Am I ever going to uh, print it on the side of a house? No. Exactly. No. It's nice to have the option. But you know what? Give it a few more years. The like AI up res technology that's going to exist is, is going to, I think, really mitigate people's desire or need to, to have such high resolution, I think. But uh, two things, just to circle back. Uh, JPEG 84. Yeah, hit me. What I did like six years ago, and I don't think there's been any meaningful change in like the JPEG yeah, there's no way they've touched presses. that. Yeah, nobody's touched that. Um, what I did was create, I think I had like four uh, various pictures. One in black and white, one in color with a lot of detail. Another one in black and white with a lot of detail. And then a color with very little detail. Black and white with very little detail. So like two black and white, two color, lots of detail, very little detail. Uh, because the amount of detail in an image generally affects the, the overall file size as well. I ex exported everything at JPEG quality 50, 60, 70, and then 71, 2, 3, all the way up to 100. So I had, I don't know how many hundreds of images to look at. And I just did like a blind test of where I could start to see quality differences. And that landed me somewhere in the like 75 to 90 JPEG 75 to 90 range across all of them. Then I started to look at the um, results between that uh, and where the quality versus the file savings trade-off seemed to reach like an equilibrium. And JPEG quality 84 or 85 was right in that sweet spot where I couldn't tell any difference and it seemed to give me the best uh, file savings overall. So that was my process of coming up with that. <laughs> Are you trying um, to save file space though? I just wanted like the the maximum um, quality with the least amount of storage space, yeah, overall. This was back also when it was a little bit more worth thinking through. The 2015-16 era, like bandwidth was a lot slower. 3G was still the thing for, you know, cell phones. Like I was, I was a little bit more concerned with that for clients, uh, like speed and all of that. And honestly, you don't really need um, JPEG 100 uh, unless you're, you know, JPEGs degrade over quality if you open a JPEG, edit it, and then save it again on itself as a JPEG. You lose quality every time you do that. But I'm hoping my clients aren't re-editing my images. I export directly from the raw file to the JPEG. And so at quality 80, 84, 85, you would have to save it maybe another two or three times before you start to see uh, notable artifacts. So um, yeah, that's, that's how I landed on that. And you know what? I'm pretty sure JPEG Mini the very successful and big company, I, I think that's kind of maybe possibly all they're doing. Um, I'm not really sure. Just, ex <laughs> just I'm exporting. I'm pretty sure they're just exporting 85. at JPEG quality like 85. Uh, but it's such an easy to use nothing interface. You just click and drag your files into their the window and nobody, nobody asks any more questions than that. 
And they're just like, yeah, I can't tell the difference. I'm saving a lot of file size. Because uh, <laughs> I also compared all of those um, results with the JPEG minis stuff. And that's not to say that's not a useful thing to be able to just click and drag and you know basically have a smaller file export at JPEG 80, 85. I don't know that it's worth paying for. 85, okay. That's nice. Okay, so you deliver 5,000, <laughs> which means, yeah, so everything's the same size. That makes sense to me. Uh, For the most part, unless I've heavily cropped in on something, but that's so rare, you know, I, I assume clients, Yeah. That, even if they do notice. pay attention to the resolution size, they don't care or wouldn't notice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now I just don't know, right? So, like, the, if the plan is, you know, <laughs> sell at least one of the cameras to purchase additional things, right? Like I should have a native yeah. uh, lens with autofocus for the GFX at some point, right? Like you I need, maybe. I'm still looking for that. Still looking for that lens. <laughs> still looking for that. You haven't even <laughs> been home since I asked about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, so uh, much has happened since we talked last. Have you installed the new Lightroom? No, I haven't installed the new Lightroom. We also launched a integration with Capture One yesterday, our first official API integration. That was nice. Oh, thank you for reminding me. As you tell everybody about this, I'm gonna try and keep this as a tradition and post on Glass. I was, I want to oh, post yeah, on yeah, Glass yeah, every yeah. time we record. Po po post your stuff. Uh, yeah, so we launched a, launched a integration with Capture One yesterday, so you can publish, uh, connect your glass account to capture one, your capture one library and publish directly from your library to, uh, to glass. It's, it's a delight. It's wonderful. If you're a capture one user, make sure to upgrade or, uh, download the update depending on how you do it. Cause they sell licenses, uh, bless them for that. We love a licensed piece of software. May it live forever. It won't, but may it. Uh, or, you know, if you need to, just switch over to their subscription. That's also great. We also love a subscription service because you don't have to pay for upgrades like this one. Right. With the licensing, you you that kind of basically allows you to keep it working, but you can skip years for as long as you want. But, yeah. I mean, isn't it basically always going to be the case that newer computers or processors or some aspect of new technology is going to force your hand? To have uh, to I mean, eventually, the license yeah. Anyway. yeah. Okay. There's a, I mean, like there, there are some folks who stick with their computer, right? Like, uh, I mean, this doesn't count because he no longer actually writes. Uh, but George R. R. Martin used to, he writes on like Microsoft Word three on like a computer from like nineteen ninety six. I've more than once been tempted to buy an old like Apple E two or whatever that like. Uh, no, like the, the, dream, the, the dream, the dream is, is buying the Apple iMac G4, the little bulb with oh, really? the stick. I love that computer so much. Oh, wow. Okay. Do you not love that computer? Uh, wow. I don't know. I, G4 cool. iMac. Pretty sure it's a G4 iMac? Yeah, the one with the like head. Like the, yeah, um, the little base. And, and the, yeah, yeah, that is a cool computer. You're right. It's, no, it's I, I'm thinking even older. I'm thinking like way, like monochrome screen days. But anyway. Oh, that was going to actually. So a lot of people have been talking about, uh, since you brought up Capture One, and I had mentioned Lightroom, the newest version of Lightroom. Awful. Just so bad. Cool feature. Cool new feature. Totally fine. The, the the idea is cool to have like extra lens blur. We did talk about that, but it's yeah. become very clear since then that they or something happened in the structure of the, the the catalog database that they use or something where it's just buggy and slow. Sometimes it's fast. A lot of times it's just slow. Uh, it's bad, and uh, a lot of people are rolling back to the previous version because the, the newer features of the uh, lens blur and some other things just aren't worth the trade-off in performance. And so I started thinking like, you know, eventually I have to believe they're gonna, they're gonna wanna kill off classic and move on. Yep, and I'm, I'm that is Lightroom. my fear. Yeah, yeah we, and that's been a suspicion 
ever since I think they renamed Lightroom to have Classic and Lightroom, Lightroom, which they should have named Lightroom Cloud in my opinion, uh, be what it is. Where was I going with that? The, oh, I'm wondering if maybe they're going to start to do some things to just purposely uh, hobble, hobble, I don't know the right word. Degrade. Degrade, thank you. Purposely Purposely degrade degrade. the software of Classic so that people nudge over to Lightroom, Lightroom. I think- I will never. uh, I don't know that they would actually do that. That seems a little conspiratorial and not in the best interest of users, but I wouldn't put it past a company to do that. Uh, More likely, I would think they're gonna release some like really killer feature that everybody's just willing to begrudgingly finally make the change, like maybe liquify, native liquify of your raw files instead of having to jump over to Photoshop for that or something. I could see that being enough of a compelling feature that everyone's like, fine, okay, I'll move over. But I could also see a world where Lightroom, Lightroom, the Lightroom cloud is still never quite as, because they really nailed it with Lightroom Classics kind of workflow and process and how the the file tree and everything. Yeah, the information to... structure of it is why I stick with it. Yeah, yeah. They, the... they kind of abstracted that away for the most part, leaning, I think, a little too early and a little too much into the cloud concept, um, the, kind of the way Apple does, which is still not great with their files app and iCloud. Yeah. It's just sort of messy. And so... But I could see a world where they, it takes them so long to ever get that right that I'm sitting on this exact laptop or the most, the last laptop I can possibly run and use Lightroom Classic and forever. just have it be like isolated from the internet in a box forever. Problem with that, of course, is if I ever want to upgrade new cameras, they can stop supporting those cameras in, <laughs> in Lightroom, which is a bummer. I don't want to sound like a Luddite here, you know, um, but when is technology going to be done? You know? I know. <laughs> right? Like, I, I, because uh, we've paired endless growth with endless technological improvements, but how many more megapixels do I need? Right? You know, like, I, agree. I have 102 right now. That's more than enough. Right, you know, when they release the 150 megapixel sensor that uh, directly takes on phase one, and it's like, ha ha, this is only ten thousand dollars or twelve thousand dollars. What a treat! Come through to real medium format. You don't need that. I don't need that. No, and no, no. Like t- twelve of us need that, uh, and, and and we are not them. Um, and like, I don't know what to do with it. Right, you know, like. The, yeah. My new laptop, I got a, um, before uh, before we went to the Pacific Northwest this last summer, uh, I got I got a new laptop. And so I was just like, okay, cool. What's the best one I can afford? Great. I'll take it. And I just like bought a baseline of one of the best uh, M2 MacBook Pros. And it's amazing. Like, it's it is amazing. And it's so much better than uh, the M1 iMac that I had been using. And mm-hmm. it was better than the Intel MacBook Pro that I had before. But, you know, an M3 or an M6 or, like, it it, it edits my 100 megapixel photos instantly. Uh, it, like, mm-hmm. it edits the RAWs. I'm not using smart previews because you still haven't come to fix my Lightroom yet. And so I'm just like, boop, 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 editing the whole thing in Lightroom. It's fine. It takes like three seconds to export. I exported it uh, like a 4K video the other day for, you know, a, a, a soon to be launched YouTube channel. Uh, and I exported a nice. 4K video that was like six minutes long and it took like 40 seconds. Hmm. And that was that. like, that's, that's enough. Fast. Right, like how much how much yeah. more do I need? <laughs> what I I totally agree. Uh, it's it is interesting to think about the fact that okay, did you ever own a computer in the era of the way they like something about the programming 
they would program based on the assumption of the exact processor that the thing was going to be running on. Maybe this was like 386, 486 days. But certain apps that people call them now, but programs, um, that you could, if you bought like a Intel 100 megahertz machine or something crazy fast compared to a 3 or 486, certain apps you would open and they would be unusable because they would run so fast that you could like they would run so fast you couldn't use them because the processing power had increased so um, beyond what the original writers of that program ever thought that you couldn't play it. It, it. Mostly I think it had to do with gaming. Like you would open a game like Frogger or something and the fro the cars would be like zipping by because it was literally built, predicated on the fact that the, they knew the processing speed you were gonna be using. And anything faster than that broke the experience. Did you ever experience that in computing? Was that? I a little too well, old? I'm now experiencing the other side of it uh, in in computing. So um, I, I play a game from time to time, and uh, Spider Man Two for the PlayStation Five came out last week. It's a delight. I love a Spider Man, and so I've just been turning my brain off at night playing dumb video games. Uh, and the fast travel is too fast. Hmm. It like uh, you hit a button and you're suddenly on the other side of New York instantly. And that's amazing, right? <laughs> like there's no loading screen. There's nothing. But it like breaks my brain. It, fe hmm. it feels too fast and like it takes me out of the immersive experience as opposed to like, okay, I did the, I hit a button. I can like take a breath. Whew, it's too fast. Mm -hmm. Technology is too good so now. I it do. Is, I am but, a luddite, but, I guess. Oh no! But I will say it's interesting to think about the the pushing or the innovation and and want and need to have a new idea and have it be realized in an era of technology, whatever era that is, um, that you can finally put it out and it's usable. This is a great example. The Nikon or the the Adobe's newest newer feature, the the AI denoise feature. Per image, or they're like portrait AI retouch, per image it takes, you know, 10 or 15 seconds. So yeah. I, I would imagine they had the technology to do that years ago, but it probably took two minutes per, or some, you know, theoretically just it took longer in a way that, yeah, it's a cool feature to have, but no, literally nobody would use because it's so slow. And so it's interesting just rhetorically to think about where uh, things have been technically achieved already now, but just aren't going to be released or not ready because processing power isn't quite there yet. And the balancing act between uh, trying to establish like, okay, people are actually going to use this thing uh, because it's fast enough. But anyway, at the end of the day, as fast as things are, I still would love to see a certain version of software or a certain approach by maybe a manufacturer of software uh, where it isn't about the specs running uh, or, you know, being Moore's law, just ever ex exponentially yeah. increasing, but it's about the apps themselves stopping, pushing the limits of adding lens blur, adding denoise or some other things that they're nice to have, but nobody actually really needs. Like Lightroom, the way it worked fundamentally, um, back basically when they added smart previews or something like that, I think is, is right where they could have brick walled everything. And if you were running that same version of Lightroom on a computer now, which I haven't tried, I'd be very curious to see how, how fast it, it could be. Uh, I'm talking like you, if you had this as the ethos of your software, you could almost approach, I think, a real time situation. Like why, how many things would change in my approach and thought process if, if I hit upload or export on an 800 image wedding gallery and in real time, it was instantly available to my clients. You know, this would also have to be in a world where internet speed had become so fast that up uploading was instantaneous, which is going to be a while, but it's just, um, it's really unfortunate. Like there used to be this mindset 15, 20 years ago that everything was going to be a thin client and all your competing was going to be in the cloud because internet would be fast enough that you wouldn't need a processor in your hand. It could just be a real-time remote, essentially, experience of your phone. But that has never happened, and I don't see how it's ever going to happen if in tandem, as bandwidth increases, as processing power increases, all of our software continues to always try and add new things that, like you said, we don't really need. Uh, I don't know. That was a lot. 
<laughs> Sorry. No, but it's okay. It a, I'm in. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't know what the... I mean, imagine website speeds and the internet experience from 2012 to 2016. If Oh, websites uh, are bad now. The web's yeah. broken. We broke the web in a yeah, real fundamental way. Uh, everything is slower than it used to be. Everything, you know, Google doesn't work anymore. <laughs> it really doesn't. Uh, DuckDuckGo, I think I've shot at it a few times. The, yeah. the results I get from them are consistently great. And last I checked, I think I still ranked really high for DC wedding photographer. DuckDuckGo. Oh my God, I need to put up a, I need to put up a, my, my, <laughs> I can't, I can't actually decide if I want to try and shoot some like first person weddings like main so what's that what's the actual term because second shooter is the second shooter what's the first is it it's not first shooter primary 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 you know we should probably move away from the language of shooter uh probably this is top of mind because somebody at the after party last night lives in maine and she was uh, having a a great time but started to kind of oscillate between trying to have fun and the fact that there was yet another mass shooting in the u.s right in her hometown or if not very very close people are like sending her messages like we're okay we're, we're okay we're sheltering yeah. in place anyway Pass. i've always hated the 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 phrasing of photography related to shooting it's like yeah. the more those kinds of incidents happen it's like god let's just get it let's just eject the entire language of guns from our vocabulary please uh Anyway. Also the guns. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so the, yeah, like I don't, primary I, I don't know if That's... I want to actually do primary shooting next year or if I want to like just continue to second shoot whenever a friend needs me. Uh, but if I do, I would need to like make that. I would need to make a website about it. I need to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ugh. you're pretty good at that. I hear uh, so so I've heard, so I've been told, so I have, you know, that that's the easy part. The website's the easy part. Uh, the hard part is actually probably getting images because I, you know, like I have shot mm. like zero photos uh, any that of these weddings really on my own. Yeah, that segues really nicely into another topic whenever you're ready to wrap up. No, hit me. This, What's this, this new topic? topic? Okay, there's another thing that came up a lot yesterday because a few people uh, used to live in Europe. There were a lot of, I guess, Canadian immigrants uh, that attended this conference, and they were from various parts of Europe and struggling. Uh, they were just trying to get their photography business started and get that momentum going. And in Europe, they were essentially incapable of being able to do this because the privacy laws are so restrictive. Um, they their client, the underlying assumption from basically everybody in Europe is that you can't publish freely any of the photos anywhere for any use, whether you're making money from it or not, including and especially on social media without explicit written permission from your clients. Like I think it has to be a separate signature in order to be able to do that. You can't just build it into your wedding contract or something along those lines. Maybe it depends per country, but yeah. they're starting and trying to build this photography business and not able to use most of the images from most of what they're shooting and it's going to be interesting Uh, you know the u.s doesn't have that law right now but i could see a world and you know everyone in the u.s and sometimes canada tend to lean into the freedom aspect of of what the mindset that that exists here but even even without that i think or sorry, even with that, I think Americans and generally everyone in society is going to start push back, pushing back quite a lot about having their image or likeness anywhere on the internet because of how much manipulation and distortion and <clears throat> uh, weird shit you're going to be able to do with it in AI rendering stuff. Yeah. So I think the baseline underlying assumption across the world for everybody at some point is probably going to be, whoa, you can't put why'd you put my image on the internet? You can't do that. We didn't say that. And we don't want that. And that really makes it a a pretty crazy difficult problem for for all photographers across the board to maintain momentum and continue to be discovered and hired, but especially people who are in your position that want to just get started 
like, how can you do that when you can't show your work? How are you possibly going to get enough clients to ever have a full-time position doing this if you can't show your work? Yeah, you can open a studio and have like a street side thing maybe, but that's not going to bring in enough wedding clients to do anything. Like that's, it's just not the reality anymore. So it's a really tricky thing. And it, if anything, I think it's going to insulate people that have established a really strong presence in the wedding industry. It's going to insulate them because they have the back catalog of images that are already out there that most clients from, you know, decades ago have, don't care about. Or like I said, yeah. the, the cat's already out of the bag for them. But for newer people, I, I really, really worry about how you're going to be able to do that. Again, it's not a huge issue now in the U.S., but uh, it's a big issue in Europe for, for people that are trying to break into the industry. The contraction... Good news for established players, but... Right, like, we, we've, like, pushed, like, everything too... We've gone too far in one direction, and so now we're pulling back, uh, as is, you know, humanity's tradition of... Yeah. Uh, but like, you know, as you were talking about that, I, all I can think about is like the next 18 months just being a nightmare, right? Like the next U S election cycle, the next, uh, news, you know, uh, as we like deal with the news, uh, you know, Twitter being dead and broken and threads. Can I actively... shout out, by the way, ground, ground news, excellent app. I don't know if you've heard of it or it was ever on your radar, but it, great news app, uh, that I don't remember exactly how I came across it, but they do a very good job of, I mean, again, who, who watches the watchers <laughs> is always an interesting question, but they seem to do a fairly good job of categorizing things in a way that are clearly labeled as far as where the articles come from any topic is left center or right focused and any kind of headline that they surface they give you a spectrum of articles to read from across all of those uh leanings so for example i'm looking at a random article sad story yes but i'm sure this happens all the time throughout the world a seven-year-old boy struck and killed by nypd tow truck that's <laughs> Tragic. That's awful. Uh, but you read the articles and you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different uh, publications that are talking about the same story and then sort by center, national versus local versus like regional, uh, left leaning, right leaning. So you can actually all in one tab scroll through each of these. And somehow, I don't know if they're playing some tricky game here, but somehow I've never, I do see embedded ads, but I've never been presented with that super annoying, uh, you know, subscribe. You, like, you read the first two paragraphs and you need to subscribe. This is yeah. a pay for app, by the way. So maybe they have like an agreement to give par partial bits of their funding to these apps. Anyway, ground news, check it out. Uh, sorry, continue. Next yeah, I'm months. just, I'm just like, I'm already physically exhausted. I like the the internet <laughs> is about to get so much worse, and I don't really know what yes, to do about is. it. I mean, like, I'm literally spending all day, every day, trying to make a nice little corner of it. Uh, it's it's what I pour all of my energy into because that's all I can do is like help make a nice little corner of it because no one's fixing the internet, no one's fixing misinformation, no one's like this isn't a systematic systemic problems aren't getting fixed by individual actions but individual actions still matter and so like i'm putting forth a lot of effort and I'm like man ha, i'm tired <laughs> right like yeah. i'm tired right now building my own nice little corner of the internet for people and <laughs> it's only gonna get harder and worse over the next yeah 12 the to 18 of the months. internet means it is literally an unlimited energy suck if you let it be that and and it's so difficult to i think establish where you shouldn't let it be all right where is that boundary because everything especially uh, things that are politicized or have to do with life and death and war and all of that can feel like this should be my priority this is you know something that uh easily is justifiable is like what you should spend your life working on but the other reality is, you know, you live where you live and you can control and influence what you can control. So there are like limits to like how much the unlimited um, nature of the internet uh, should be allowed to take your energy. It's tough, man. I, I know what you mean about the like physical exhaustion, even though it's your, it's your, your, your mind. 
Yeah. Uh, it's just a body. Crazy. Bodies, man. Who needs them? I wish they wouldn't keep score. They say they they keep score, and I believe them, and I wish they'd forget. Well, this is where I can honestly make the case for, you know, like multiple personality disorder or something like that. Like if you could force yourself to, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just, okay. So for anybody, I don't know. Should we, should I plug the Instagram account I sent you earlier today? Oh God, no, you should not. That thing plug. is crazy. This is one of the rare times where I'm like, oh my gosh, this person has delusions of grandeur and uh, clearly psychotic. Uh, it's an amazing account, though. And the so basically, I just wanted <laughs> we're getting on some crazy tangents, but this is a fun little thirty minute dive I took somehow this morning. Somebody Wait, that was thirty minutes. I I've been reading through their yeah. posts for like thirty minutes. Somebody's convinced that they are the ghostwriter for basically every successful song and movie from the past, basically from the eighties through the aughts. So for like 30 years, they were the ghostwriter for Nirvana songs and Harry Potter script and uh, uh, all sorts of things. But what this person writes isn't like rambling lunacy. I mean, it is in terms of the actual dots that they're trying to connect, but it's like written in a way that doesn't necessarily, if you were capable of understanding English, and popped onto planet Earth, and you were reading these posts, you'd be like, wow, that's amazing history. I had no idea that was possible, like, that that was the case. I did, this person is so incredible. They were this so person's prolific. For it doesn't sound like a ranting lunatic, but <laughs> it's clearly that. And, uh, you know, if you can lie to yourself that deeply, then maybe your body doesn't keep a score. I don't know. <laughs> Was that a it book, does. by the way, or is that just a phrase that got popular? It, it is a book. It's about how your body remembers trauma in subconscious ways and like oh, okay. will pop up when it's triggered and you won't know why if you're not paying attention. And like In terms of like physical disease or ailments and stuff? or uh, I mean, like um, my, my goddaughter, uh, when she was 10... Uh, was diagnosed with uh, leukemia. She successfully mm. completed treatment, went into remission. Hooray. That was amazing. Uh, hellscape of a two-year period, though. Just dreadful stuff. Uh, and that was also <laughs> like five months before the pandemic started. So Whoa. Uh, it was like, it was a, it was a pretty rough 2020. Um, but I have like a physical reaction to um, November 19th uh, ah, because like that's the, that's the um, yeah. date that we found out that, and she got diagnosed um, or like, you know, I had, you can have like a really bad breakup or something and it'll pop up or whatever. So like there, the, you know, or it can be like a situational thing, like um, right after we moved to Oaxaca, uh, like three days after we moved to Oaxaca, Pancho and I were on a on our morning walk and were attacked by uh, two loose guard dogs. Uh, and like, I nearly lost an eye and he nearly died. And like, I physically fought off two massive dogs. Uh, and then every time that I took a walk, ha ha, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, like walked by that spot, I like got physically tense and like was reactive to that and was like ready to fight two massive dogs the size of me. Yeah. Uh, but instead it was, you know, just me walking. It just had happened 100%. there. So. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so my and, body was and that makes keeping sense. track of that. That makes sense. You're, yep. It's kind of maybe the closest thing I can compare it to was, uh, is when I'm, when I start thinking about motion sickness, it and I have like a flight to get on or a roller coaster to hop in, I uh, th I have to do whatever I can to trick myself into not thinking about it because the more I worry about am I going to get motion sick or not, the more I think about it and the more I start to remember when I have before and it becomes this like vicious cycle of, yep, yeah, I'm going to get motion sick. <laughs> and yeah. for whatever reason, when I let myself think about it too much, oh God, I have a flight later today, <laughs> by the way. Stop um, thinking about it. think about, about it, it too much, uh, I inevitably get sick. So actually the only real defense that I've ever consistently come up with is to not eat that day if i if i think i'm going to get motion sick sometimes i can't drink anything either like water uh or i will throw that up but anyway 
been a while. But yeah, it's that was a, that uh, was a, that was a fun but... bit of information. Oh yes, I've I've got many uh, horrible stories about how how often I get motion sick in places. I've literally I've gotten sick from the the Tesla self driving me down the highway because I wasn't well, driving myself and got motion sick from. No, it's not because it's bad. It's like. Um, Tell driving. that to it's all the people it's smooth. run over, Sam. It's something about the disconnect between, you know, how uh, controlling my body and the environment around me. Anyway, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well, I feel like there's like a million other things. It's been like two weeks since we've done one of these, but I, I feel pretty good about the, the highlights of what we yeah. discussed. I'm excited to show you. I think my ZF was delivered yesterday, so I'll, uh, I'll bring that. I'm just in the final, final ending stretch last inning of uh weddings before i get a little bit of a break and can start to breathe my and is uh, is there here's a here's a question can well i mean i guess it's two questions i was gonna say can i come to one of them but what i would want to do is i would want to do the b h window maybe maybe do a win like the return window purchase the new oh Purchase like a new GFX or the or a ZF or something. There's something in there with a window and shoot a thing to see if it works. Amazon's pretty good about that too. Amazon returns. I think it they they keep track of how much money you literally spend with them and don't return versus how much uh, you do return and then the value of the things you return. You know, if you if you buy a thousand items at a dollar each and don't return any of them, and then buy a three thousand dollar camera body and return that, that's probably going to raise some red flags. But uh, in my I've never returned because I spend anything. a lot of money with Amazon across the board, and I return things very rarely. I've never had an issue returning expensive gear to Amazon, uh, and I only bring that up because you mentioned B and H, and I will say I personally have never had an issue returning things to B and H. Very very expensive items uh, throughout their entire thirty day window, but other people um, have come across say it's a nightmare. I don't know if they live internationally or maybe they're not in the US, maybe they're Canadian or something, I have no idea. But other people have said they've had issues. And again, I don't know if that's a, it's good for me, Sam, because I used to have B&H affiliate links and stuff like that when they tried to ramp that program up. I don't use those at all now because it was such a pain to get a link every time. You had to like go into this back end and log in and find the product in the catalog by searching. You couldn't just go to the products page and get a simple, it was a nightmare. So I never used affiliate links, but I might be in a, a, Special, a special zone zone where they don't check or something i don't know but uh i also don't make them any money directly to, uh, anyway but, my problem so, is so executive for anybody out there. Yeah. i just don't okay. i don't i i i'm like i need to return this and then i forget and then i don't do it oh, and then i miss the window you know what really That's helps my problem. with that is uh doordash now uh will let you order a pickup for somebody to come and grab it and take it to UPS or FedEx directly from your door. And what's cool is there's no delivery fees and it's 100% tip based. So the person that agrees to pick it up, you set the rate, oh, it's a $3 flat fee no matter what. Um, and then the person that comes to pick it up, they get 100% of the, the tip. So typically I do the $3 flat rate plus a $5 tip and the dasher gets to only, they don't have to make the triangle, they just have to go to where I am and then to UPS and drop it off. It's way better for their time, especially if you do multiple packages. Uh, they make a lot of money, I think, in doing that compared to actually doing restaurant runs. So DoorDash, check it out. I think you have to, the only catch with it is you have to be paying their annual Dash Pass fee. The, That's where they the only catch is you have to actually spend more money than the flat fee of $3. <laughs> well, yeah. I use it a lot anyway for, for food delivery, but yeah, for you your know, it might seem your ridiculous morning... to pay to to get a package delivered, but I'm exactly like you. I will procrastinate until I miss the return window, either because yeah, executive function or I'm uh, traveling and I forget. But DoorDash uh, has enabled a lot less stress when it comes to returning things. So, well, you know, uh, I like to tune in big tech companies, but they tune in it. tune in next week where we can find <laughs> out the thrilling end if Daniel actually returned the lens that he needs to. That's sitting on his. Is that what happened with the Miticon lens that you love? 
did you just well, actually love that lens or was it? Oh, a, no, I, I no, definitely I absolutely love that lens. I, okay. uh, <laughs> it is I cool. bought that. I, I wasn't sure how long you were going to let me borrow the camera. And so I was like, yeah. oh, I'm right. clearly going to just have to give this back in the next 30 days. And then yeah. he's stuck with the lens that you can't use. Yeah. Here, here I am 60 hundred days later or whatever we're at anyway <laughs> i appreciate you Let's all see. right i appreciate you too i appreciate our appreciated listeners <laughs> yeah Thank we're gonna guys. have to send in and your guess. send in your suggestions for names so we can get some shirts or something yeah we could call them i would like to off board this from my to-do list so please onboard yeah. this everyone else think about it okay. ingest it let us know. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah.